And now, right to your hosts of Down the Garden Path, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing. Welcome to Down the Garden Path, where we discuss down-to-earth tips and advice while doing our best to help you seasonally manage your garden and landscape. I'm Joanne Shaw, owner of Down to Earth Landscape Design, and with me is my co-host, Matthew Dressing. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Joanne, and good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Matthew Dressing, owner of Natural Affinity Garden Design. As landscape designers and gardeners, we believe it's important and possible to have great gardens, which are sustainable and low maintenance, and we want to help you make it happen. That's right. And this month, we've been talking all about planting your garden, growing hydroponically, and growing anywhere you can squeeze in a plant. And tonight, we're joined by what we're going to call Down the Garden Path all-star guest, Julia DeMarcos, to help us learn about grow lights and explore her new ebook, How to Plan a Vegetable Garden, available now at www.juliademacos.com. So if you'd like to shed some light on your indoor growing and garden planning, and you'd like to ask, or sorry, if you'd like Julia to shed some light on your indoor growing and garden planning, send her a question at instudio101 at gmail.com. Matt, for many of our listeners, uh, Matt is teaching and he will join us as soon as he's able to. I know people missed him last week and wondered where he went, um, but he's teaching and recording from as soon as the class ends from his classroom. So, uh, but in the meantime, Julia and I are going to have a lot of fun, right, Julia? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So to tell you a little bit, if you haven't listened to her past shows, uh, Julia gardens organically and tries to keep things simple while growing new and uncommon vegetables each year. Her garden is located in Mono, 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 Ontario, (laughs) and, and 25 acres on the Niagara Escarpment. Two years ago, Julia expanded her vegetable garden from 2,000 to 7,000 feet. I'm guessing that was three years ago now, It's actually right? three years ago now. Yeah, yep. I was going to update that. <laughs> That's right. Continuing in the formal kitchen garden style. She loves to inspire others to have their own vegetable gardens by showing them the simpler side of gardening. And she enjoys teaching others, speaking, and holding workshops. And you're so good at it, which is why we love having you as a guest on the show. So Welcome. Thank you so much for having me again. I love this. This is so much fun. Every time I you ask me to come to join you, I just love it. Oh, that's good. That's good. We, it's <laughs> it's fun. It's like we're just having a coffee chat while talking about gardening. What's right? And I have my coffee, so yes, <laughs> well <I'm> set. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. There you go. So, have you, as long as you've been gardening and and growing vegetables, have you been using um, grow lights that whole time, or did you get to a point when you thought, okay, now I, I'm ready for that a bigger setup? So, this is my eleventh year, and I would say the first year that I started growing food, I didn't start any of my own seeds because I had no experience then, and I just wanted, I just, you know, I was like a deer in a headlight when I first started, and I went to the garden center, and I purchased everything that I could to get started. I had a few seed packets, but whatever I purchased that was seed went right in the ground, and so that winter, I did a lot of research and reading, and I discovered grow lights, and I discovered that if I want to grow my own, I need to grow from seed, so, you know, I, right away, we started, I had the shelves built immediately, and I started using them immediately. And they've kind of been my must have in order to have success. Because, you know, right now the days are short. They're not long enough to grow any kind of seedlings really uh, without having them become weakened and become lanky, always leaning towards the window. So by having shorter, stockier, stronger seedlings, I've always used the grow lights. And I just expanded on how many I have now because mm-hmm. of the size of the garden. Yeah, yeah. you raise a good point because I think so many people that might have sunny windows or a lot of bright light in their in their home um, think, oh, well, I mean, I, I'm fine with daylight, right? I can I can set them up in front of the window and it, it'll all be good. Um, but that's not the it's, it's not just the, the brightness of the light. It's the length, like you said, the amount of light. Um, and mm-hmm. also that the fact that if there are plants in there, one thing for your house plants to be leaning and you, you know, you have to rotate them every once in a while, but seedlings, it's not good for them, right? Yeah. So think about it like 
right now the days are short and the sun is far from us right now in our part of the northern hemisphere right so the sun never actually rises like it does in the summertime where it's like right up in the sky right now it's kind of always in the horizon and right in your eyes so whenever it's a sunny day you know it's it feels like when you're driving in rush hour and the light the sun is directly in your eyes well that's already sun setting well during the winter our sun sits there all the time so it's never high enough to actually project enough light and number one number two i grow under the growth lights i keep the lights on for 16 hours right so they run 16 hours on eight hours off every single day and i find that they need that you know in order to have enough light i you know i'd never get 16 hours of daylight right now now we've got maybe nine so yeah. already we're short, but mm -hmm. you know, if you don't, if you're not growing a lot of different varieties and if you're growing mostly heat loving veggies and you wait until let's say end of April to start your seeds, you can start, the days are longer then. So you can mm -hmm. use your window to start your tomatoes and start your cucumbers and your squash. You can then find your sunniest window, which would be your South facing window. West is good as well both those windows if you have a southwest facing window then you actually have more light morning sun does not classify or quantify as the full sun it's that would be like a part shade because it's not as strong so you're looking for afternoon sun so you know at that time of year and i have been successful when we moved here that first year my grow lights were still packed up so i had no choice and i started a tray of seedlings you know in my south what facing window and they were okay. fine and they were tomatoes and they were uh they were zucchini and uh cucumber and they were fine because starting them first week you know may 1st with that time of year there's enough daylight and that's enough time to be able to start the seeds to get them to be big enough to transplant so yeah because of where we live and not only that the window itself acts like a filter one thing to be outside you've got direct light through a window you've lost lumens so you've lost a lot of that like foot candles of light right and so mm -hmm. the only the side that's actually at the window and only if your plant is literally smack dab against the window that would have the most light and only on the side of the plant that's actually at the window the side of the plant that's away from the window ha doesn't have light it's the shady side so the plant is growing towards right. the light and only grows on the one side which is the window side makes it look like it's lanky and leaning but it's actually just growing longer on that side so that's oh, why okay. it has that look to it you really yeah. want to be turning the plant on a regular basis so that it grows evenly it needs to even out but that's why because it's so the light is being filtered and it's actually dark on the other side of the plant so okay that's why grow lights you know if they're not a, they're not that complicated and there's especially today when i started there wasn't a lot of selection but today there's so much to choose from and you know to give yourself a head start to give yourself a good start i, I suggest grow lights okay yeah excellent yeah. um now it's early still like it is january i know you started i, I follow you on social media so i know you started <laughs> a few of the more challenging things because there are some things that need like i think it, lavender right you'd started that lavender last year. Some things need Actually, a little no, bit longer. That was, yeah, so lavender was almost three weeks ago. Oh, lavender grows extremely, I think I started it the 11th of January. Is that three weeks now? Yeah. yeah. So lavender, any kind of perennial herb needs a long time, but especially lavender and uh, rosemary and lemongrass is not a perennial herb, but it has a really long growing season. So you can't wait to start that later. It needs to be able to okay. go into the garden in a reasonable size, right? So lavender grows so slowly. It's the same family as corn, actually. So it, it's grass, it's really? the grass family. Yeah, so it, it's interesting because last year when I put my lavender out, I put it in the same bed where I had my corn the previous year, which was the popcorn. And the plants looked exactly the same, but corn grows so quickly and they actually were the same size. But corn, I would start about six, four to six weeks before the final frost date where I started the lavender in January and they went out at the exact same, they're about a foot tall. So you can see like how the, the speed of growth is really slow for la for lemongrass. So I, did I say lavender before? I meant lemongrass. Uh, okay. So le lemongrass needs that extra time. So lemongrass, corn, same family. And right. it, yeah, anyway, so it needs that extra time, but it does catch up because it needs the heat, it needs the sun. And in the summertime, they will catch up as long as you give them that head start but if you're going to put out like two two inch tall seedlings you're not they're not going to amount to anything over the summer so they need that head start so yeah that would start now uh in the past i'm not doing it this year but i would start leeks now so leeks take a really long time longer than onions 
So they should be started now. And last year I started them, I believe is the third or fourth week of January. Onions would start in February. Not everyone starts in February, but I like to. I like to put out larger uh, seedlings into the garden. And you would also could start celery and celeriac now or okay. first week of February, because they have a really long growing season, season and they grow so slowly that they do need the extra time to amount to something, right? And if you, mm-hmm. and it would, you know, also if the seeds don't germinate, they do take a while, if the seeds don't germinate, you forget to water them and they dry out quickly and die, then you have a chance to plant them yeah. again. So that's right. why it's good to get them started earlier. But I wouldn't okay. do, you know, Lysianthus is another one if you're growing Lysianthus from seed as a flower, that grows, you know, it's like watching paint dry. It's the slowest thing ever. So you want to start that now. <laughs> yes, I've heard that, that that is a really challenging one. I've seen some flower farmers and they like, even it, once it's in the field, like in July, they're still like standing there oh. going, are they growing? Are they growing? Yeah. yeah. I grew them last year and I had some that flowered and some that never amounted to anything. They just sat there, you know, they just, yeah. it's, it's unbelievably slow. So anything that's like that, you want to get started now. And then, you know, you start adding more each month, but I would okay. say those are the, the main ones. Yeah. 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 Okay. But for the things that, cause I'm often worried, you know, most people are like the tomato and the pepper growers, you know, the, the same bread and butter, you know, type of, of plants. Um, but then they, like, I've already seen posts from people like, oh yeah, my peppers are like two inches on my grow lights. And I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, so, so I think. Yeah. So you have to be ready to sustain those peppers. Yeah. They need to be transplanted into larger pots because you can't leave them in a four inch pot or six inch pot, pot and like start them now and then hope that they will survive until transplanting out in the, after June 1st because they need more space for their roots. They need nutrition. You know, the seed starting mix isn't, doesn't have anything in it. You're, so you need to pot them up. If you want to put them in a gallon size pot, yeah, then you have like a really bright place to put them and you really want to put out more mature plants by all means. You can start them early, but I think that that's like not beginner level that's more Mm, like intermediate to advanced level and you really have to be prepared to commit to those seedlings tomatoes absolutely not that's you know but you know it depends on I find like I'm going I'm online all the time and I, I follow a lot of people in the UK and they are starting their peppers now but their season their growing season is different than ours and it's also longer so I wouldn't start if if you're in zone like I'm in zone 5b I would not start peppers I'd probably wait until they do go out start earlier than tomatoes but I would say by March 1st I'm starting my hot peppers and okay. tomatoes I will start probably April 1st okay. and then they have two months to to establish yeah yeah I think people just get really keen right and and, yeah. and which is great and I and I feel so bad like I'm often saying you know no no it's okay you can slow down like it's you know and I think they want to get growing things and and stuff but um but then I feel be, it sets them up for failure right when it's not successful it and it and it's not that you're doing anything wrong it's just you started no. a little too soon um and even using tools like grow lights um you know it's not going to make it still doesn't make it perfect if you started it too soon right yeah and think about too if you have a normal grow light sitting on a normal shelf that shelf is only so tall so the plant is going to outgrow that shelf you're going to need to find some other place to put it so unless you're ready to commit as I know people that do and that's that's great like if yeah. that's what you want to do by all means you know grow it as a house plant pay attention to it make sure it's watered feed it <clears throat> pot it up when it needs potting up uh, but then you can get like a lamp style grow light to supplement yeah. you can put still put it by your sunniest brightest window but then get a lamp style grow light they sell them on amazon and it just just put the light over top of the plant and then that will supply it extra light extra light in order to to give it what it needs but you have to be ready like 14 to 16 hours a day of light on so that is energy cost you know that's don't forget like make sure it's on a timer you don't want to miss it if you have a power outage things happen so for me personally because maybe because of the size of my garden I don't want any extra work before I need it you know I'd rather just wait (laughs) until Mm -hmm. I need to take it I like to take baby steps into that big project right when I'm finally ready for it I'm ready for it right okay okay so do you have a plan like do you have it kind of like your little planner and you know based on experience from the last few years like okay this is what's working or this is what didn't work. So my planner is in my head. I'm oh. really bad at writing things down. Really bad. My journal is my phone. I just take pictures. I take a lot of pictures. So I always reflect back. So to see how things grew and to remember, 
it's really bad. I hate writing things down. I like to do spreadsheets. So I really like my laptop. I spend a lot of time on that. I write down what I'm going to plant, how many, like what varieties, how many of each. I have all that done, but then I don't record, you know, the plan. So I remember what was planted. I always remember from my head what was planted in my garden, in my big size garden. I remember exactly what was in each bed. So I don't need to write that down. I practice crop rotation. I just remember, okay, tomatoes were there. This year, I'm putting beans there. You know, I'm putting a nitrogen fixing crop in that space or something that's like, like a low feeding crop that it's not going to strip the soil, will allow the soil to rest. So I just kind of like, okay, and I do it that way. And yeah, but I, I remember now that what I start when without checking, but it's been a long time. And, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, I guess it's been a long time. I write about it. So it's kind of in my head and I just mm-hmm. kind of, it's in there, but it's definitely worth writing it down. I've tried the journaling thing. I have even purchased pretty ones and special ones with, you know, write down your yeah. crops and your seed packets and how many, with data Germany, I can't do it. It's just a lot yeah. to remember, yeah. you know, and then yeah. you miss something like, Oh, I forgot to write that down. Okay. What was it again? Like, I just don't want to, I'd rather just keep it in my head. It works better for yeah. me. Well, and I think the pictures, I think seriously pictures, I mean, Matt and I talked a lot about that, about take a picture of your garden because it is, it's a visual thing. I think many gardeners are visual. So you might not, you don't need necessarily the date, but you know, the date of the picture and the date of yeah. what it looks like, I think is, it speaks more than a note in a book, so, you know, to some people, right? And I yeah, would and be there like with you. Like you said, like you said, like I can search on my phone. I have an iPhone and I could search by month. So I know, okay, in April, I can go back April to the year, to the month. And I could see by date specifically what I did. Like, you know, I always record when the first crocus appears every single year. So rather than writing down in a journal, then losing the journal, my phone, which is saved to the cloud. So I don't have a lot like a fear of losing any information. I know what day the crocus first appeared. That's the first flower that I have. Snowdrops, I do have them too, but they're by the road. They usually get messed up by the snow plow. So you know, the crocus to me is the beginning of the season. I keep my mind on that. Last year they bloomed uh, in early March, which was really early for us to have the first blooming crocus. I don't have, you know, earlier ones here. So uh, that's my benchmark. And that's how I always keep track of it is just to review back. Okay, Mar- it was in March and then just go through all the pictures. There's the crocus. What day was that? Okay, perfect. So yeah. that's how I keep track. When was my, when did I harvest my garlic scapes? I go back. Okay, that was the date. So, because I get to see it. So, that works better okay. for me. I'm more of a visual rememberer. Yes, yes. No, no. And I'm the same, you know, more ornamental garden for me than vegetables, but I'm definitely mm. the same. And, and remembering from year to year, too, because I find a bit of it blends together, right? So, so mm-hmm. that's why it's good to have the picture because I can see 2019 versus 2018 and, and things yeah. like that, right? Exactly. Uh, and then you can do an <laughs> album. You can be like, okay, crocus album. And then you can just like put each picture into your album. And then you can just look at the album and see like, okay, that was that day that you can actually do a comparison. So yeah, I like the, the picture journaling for me is a lot better, but it's definitely worth like some kind of journaling, whether it's photo or written or yeah. you know, a spreadsheet. I think it's definitely worth it. And then that helps you remember for the following year, what to do when and what worked mm-hmm. and what didn't work. Yeah. I think that's a big part of the journaling is what you, what worked, what didn't work, um, what you, what was worth the effort and you want to do again and what frankly wasn't worth the effort and you don't want to do again, you know? So did you, do you have some that you end up cutting? Like, you know, they didn't make the cut. They didn't make the team. Do you mean after once they're in the garden? Well, this year, like what, from last year, do you have something that you look back and go, yeah, yeah. no, I'm not, uh, you know, they're off so the team. <laughs> this, this year I decided that I'm not going to do, so I've always grown something new every single year. I'm like, okay, I'm doing this this year. I've tried everything just about, I've pretty much tried just about everything that you can. I'm always searching for something new. I'm always exploring a new herb, exploring a new vegetable, a new variety. Uh, but I've grown just about everything. I would, I can't, can't think of anything I haven't grown yet. Um, and I decided that this year, I don't want to do that this year. I'd rather explore new varieties. So I'm doing a lot more tomatoes, although I didn't think I was going to do as many last year. I did have tomato blight and mold and some other problems, but I love to me, tomatoes are like gems, you know, in the garden, they're literally like, it's a, you know, they're gemstones hanging off of vines. I just love them. And so I'm doing a lot more interesting varieties this year, a lot more bicolors, a lot more speckled. And I've really explored really neat ones this year like dark galaxy I'm doing this year like I'm doing lucid jam like I'm going to do some really cool ones so I had planned only 40 plants 
I thought, okay, maybe just do 40 plants because last year I did 75. And it was a mess at the end of the season with all the disease everywhere. But I've decided I've already have 50 varieties chosen. So it's going to be 100, I think. Oh, it's going to be the big. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. So that's 10 beds. That's okay. going to be 10. So 10 a bed, 10 beds. And so I'm doing more of that, but I'm not doing any cucurbits at all. No more. This year, I'm taking a major break from cucumbers, zucchini, squash, pumpkin, gourd, melons, cucumelons, uh, anything of that family. I've had two years of really bad cucumber beetles, squash bugs, and squash vine borers. And I've only had them for two years in my experience of gardening. They came two years ago. And... I mean, I had a lot of plants two years ago and it was really great and really successful. And I worked hard to stop them, but I didn't have as many as I had last year. And last year we had a really warm May and I didn't want to plant anything out. I never plant early. Like I, I go by June 1st. Doesn't matter if May is like incredible. I just, I'd rather err on the side of cautious, yeah, caution and not plant early. Right. So, but it was such a warm May. I thought, you know what? I'll just put out a few that are really big, see what happens. Of course, we got a late frost. I think it was May 30th when we had our frost. But I have to say, I put out the pep, the uh, cucumbers in May. The next day, they were coated in cucumber beetles. So I don't know where they came from. Last, the previous year, they were out in July. I mean, May, I had cucumber beetles and squash bugs immediately, right? And so I didn't lose too many. I covered them. And then after that, they, I did lose some because there was right. that frost. But I planted them out then in June. And they were, I was just fighting, you know, I was delaying planting, like those beds, I thought, okay, I'll just tackle them all here. They're all in one bed, like a catch crop. We'll see if I can, I mean, it was a fight. I saw squash line borer moth and they are scary, right? They're huge. And I, I saw it at first. I thought, oh my goodness, what is that? Right? Like that thing's going to drill a hole in my plant. Very, you know, lay an egg yeah. and I'm finished. Like it was, and I could barely, I killed one. I couldn't catch a second. I, this year, I'm just not doing that. So they, yeah, they're okay. not on the list. None of those. Instead, I'd rather do more tomatoes, you know, like, oh, good. Yeah. Okay. See what, you know, and have some fun, take some nice photos, try it. Excellent. Things. So now <laughs> all those tomatoes, so I'm back to grow light. So now you're, you've got it set up that you can do all, you can, you're going to start all of those tomatoes inside under grow lights. Yes. I, I have three sets of grow light shelves. Each okay. shelf has one, two shelves have, th so they're shelves and they have three rows, three actual shelves on the shelf. What do you call all that thing? <laughs> Does that make sense? So yeah. in, on each shelf, I can fit four trays, the two by one by twos, whatever yeah. they are, one yeah. by two, 20, 40, one by three, they call them. one by three. Yeah. Yeah. The normal C tray, four yeah. will fit side by side. So I have two shelves like that. And then they have another shelf, which is a wire rack shelf, which has four shelves. So I have enough space and also, I have a greenhouse. So I figure but the thing is, like, once the seedlings reach uh, a good size and I transplant them into four inch pots, they don't need as much light as when they're just starting. So okay. at that point, I even have them on the floor right beside the shelf and they're fine because they're already, they're not going to get lanky and leaning anymore because they're now like a good size plant. And I find that they're fine. And then I eventually bring them to the greenhouse and they get daylight in the greenhouse and I have a heater in the greenhouse that could turn on. And, and then I, I have a transitional system, but yeah, it's going to be a lot of plants. It's going to be yeah. a lot of in and out. So that was my one beginner question was, do you, as soon as you sow, sow the seeds, they need the grow lights immediately, or do you need to wait for them to germinate and then you can do the grow lights? So I like to set everything under the grow lights immediately. And so that they're, they're not at all going to have any experience of no light, right? So I sow them. Some plants or some seeds don't want any light. So the ones that are specific to not requiring light, I don't put those out immediately, but I, you know, what I do is I top my beds, oh, sorry, all my seed trays with vermiculite. So if a seed, I find that that will give it the shade that it needs. So a, a seed that's buried in the soil with a little bit of depth that already has the shade. So it doesn't, I don't need to worry about it having light and the seeds that do need light. I put them on the soil surface and I cover it with vermiculite. So they get the light through the vermiculite. So either way, I find that all the needs are fulfilled by just sticking them under the grow lights, you know, and that works. Now, later on, as my shelves fill up then, and I'm moving a lot of things around, then yeah, then I might 
then leave it on, on the, the table and then transition it as soon as it germinates. But then I'm already like in that room all the time and I'm catching them germinating. But otherwise everything goes directly under the grow lights. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Welcome, Matt. Hi, Matt. Oh. Hi, Julia. Thanks for coming you. today. <laughs> uh, he's joined us here. So we haven't gotten to questions yet, Matt. So I don't know if you have, do you want to read the first one or do you want? Oh, let me uh, jump in here. You haven't read any questions. And I know uh, a lot of them are, are piling in here. Um, I just, there we go. Here we go. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> it's nice to see I'm you. So glad you could join us again. Yeah. Our VIP <laughs> down the garden path guest. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so we I've do been rambling few... on for like 30 minutes. <laughs> I know the time flies, eh? Oh my it gosh. Is. Uh, we have Peter, and again, I'm sorry, just joining, but Peter has asked, hello, and how long should we have our grow lights on our plants per day? So I set my lights, I don't touch the timer, 16 hours on, eight hours off. Okay. And you want to you want to give them no light for a period of time because they do need to rest. And that rest will allow them to rejuvenate, kind of rest and then keep going, give some energy. If you forget to turn them off and they always stay on, they will grow fast, but then kind of like really suffer you know, there's a lot of stress to always have the lights on. It's not natural. So if you want to do, you do want to imitate a summer type of light. And so 16 hours on, eight hours off, I find is really a good length of time. Some people do 14, 15 hours on and the other, you know, off, yeah. but I really like 16 and eight. Okay. Well, that's great. Very nice. That is good. Thank you, Peter, for that question. Dawn has written in as well. Hello, thank you for all the information tonight. What is meant by full spectrum or red, blue, and green, yellow, white spectrum? And why are the colors of the spectrum important? Thank you. Okay, great question. So <laughs> I am not a scientist, so I can't explain scientifically why. And I do have all those lights that you said. I have been really successful with regular fluorescent tubes that are daylight tubes. They sell them at Home Depot. They're, what are they? T12s, they're T12 tubes. And I just buy the daylight tubes. So I've tried those and I've been growing with those for most of the time. They, I find they, they're fine, whatever the spectrum of light that they give. Yeah. I've tried the, the grow light tubes, fluorescent, and those have are pink and they have more of a spectrum. I have not noticed a difference in growth in either one. Then I have LED lights, which are, just white LEDs, really bright, but more energy efficient and haven't noticed a difference there. And I have different watt ones. So ones that are give you 40 watts and ones that give me more than a hundred watts, 200 watts. And then I bought these other ones uh, last year from Amazon that are pink and blue and red and all those ones you said. And I haven't noticed a difference. Honestly, I have not noticed a difference. Uh -huh. They, I turn them on, I put the plants under. I didn't really notice if one gives more light than the other. Be, to be honest yeah so you haven't so noticed like them know. growing differently or anything like that no not at all really no and I thought you know last year I put a bunch of tomatoes under the pink light the pink and the LEDs with all those colors and I don't know they all just kind of produce the same size plants so it's not I, I just find it funny too because the daylights are most of them and some tomatoes grow really quickly and have end up with bigger, thicker, bolder type of plants with thicker stems. And then under the same light, I have a thin stem, smaller one. So I really don't know if it's a seed thing. I don't think it's a light thing. Um, I really think as long as you have a light, you know, as little as a daylight bulb tube, I think you'll be fine. And there's no reason to spend a fortune on it. So. Excellent. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, and I think, um, you know, you can read all the books and all the science and stuff like that. But I think, you know, for our listeners, I think going with someone who's doing it is is almost, you know, better, right? To know that, you you know, yeah. what you've seen over the time. And it's a trial and error thing. The only thing I recommend 100% is that I have it's really important to get full coverage of lights over your plants. So I get the four tube, uh, what are those, shop lights? They sell them with two tubes and four tubes. I get the four tube because I don't want my plants to have any shady spots. And I plant, I've hanged two 
one next to the other. So they, they entirely cover my shelf. I don't want any leaning. So if I found in the past, I did have the two tube shop light racks, okay. whatever yeah. those things are called. And my, my plants leaned. So even though it was the same light bulb, it wasn't enough light. So as long as it's fully covered, I mean, it's a complete coverage. And I also put foil underneath the bulbs just to give it more light reflection. Oh, and that's I find a cool that, yeah. trick. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I line, I line the uh, shop light. What do you call those things that hang the bulbs? You know, you I know, I, I know what it's like. It's a black, the black cover that the the they hang. Yeah, it's like a yeah. white. It's a white. It's a white thing. You can hang it on chains. It hangs on chains, and you oh, okay. put the you twist the tubes into it. Well, we put the the foil underneath, um, between the uh, tubes and the actual light unit. Yeah, so as a reflection, and then just reflects it back. Some people put like uh, the foil at the bottom where they put their plants too under the trays. Anywhere you put foil, I find foil helps to reflect more light. Maybe that's okay, well, that's a cool difference. tip. Excellent. Yeah. So Shane's asking if you, so, I mean, you're again, not technical and not, you know, no skin in the game in the sense, but any brand that you recommend, or you just like the four tube in the, in the daylight? Yeah, the T12. So I, I okay. use T12s because that's what fits into those shop light, um, lights. <laughs> I don't know what they're called. The four tube. Yeah. Like the light. ballast. Yeah, you know what I'm talking oh, about. Yeah. What is called? They sell them as a one. <laughs> you yeah, just buy the like, one We all know character. what you mean, but we don't nobody knows what yeah. it's called. Kind of thing. So, uh, and yeah, um, ever, shop like, because it's radio, nobody's seeing us make our hand gestures as to what it looks like, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> <laughs> just ask for the shop light for light shop light with tubes. You want to get the T12 yeah. tubes. But so I like that. And I don't know what the, the the brand is. If it's Sylvania, maybe it's Sylvania that does the lighting for that. And um, the LEDs, I honestly are just a random collection that I have going on, and it it doesn't really matter. I mean, I tried the forty watt. Forty watt is not as strong as I have one that's a two hundred watt LED. It literally looks like a panel. It's a solid white glowing light. Uh, I find that the less watt. I don't start my seeds on that shelf. You know, I find once they get to be a little bit bigger, I can transition them and then they will be fine. They have enough power, but I find a 40 watt is a bit weak to start seedlings and they do tend to lean. And I don't adjust those lights. Those lights, the LEDs don't need change. They just kind of are clipped in place okay. and they're fine. Whereas they're fine. the shop lights need to be adjusted and you want to have them two inches above the tops of the plants at all times. And then with the chains and the hooks, you get to adjust them as they grow up and you're always two inches above if they're hanging far away then it's not enough light just think of it the further it is from the from the plant the less foot candles it is for that okay. plant so it's just like putting it by the window so it's got to be directly above it by two inches in order to experience the full spectrum of coverage otherwise it's shaded right and that's when right. they start leaning yeah okay and so Matt, in in class, are you starting to grow things yet? Are you do are you going to grow things under light with your students? We have um, just some of again like the fluorescent tubes. Um, I don't think it's I don't think we have any LED lights, but we do have some of the more the red spectrum, blue spectrum lights uh, in the greenhouse. Uh, but they are very raised, very very high above. Uh, inside the greenhouse. So we're producing our floral crops and our beets and different vegetables for the, the restaurant that way. We have our microgreens much under what Julia is, is describing is, um, you know, the, like the Sylvania fluorescent tubes uh, on the light fixture with that same kind of uh, reflective banister okay. or like that cage, whatever we're trying to yeah, describe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, but <laughs> Whatever that thing is, the hood. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. On the it's light. a hood, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we do the we're doing the microgreens that way, but everything else, yeah, we use a combination of uh, the red fluorescence uh, and some of the other tubes, and then just being in the greenhouse, we're just using the sun, as much sunlight as we can get in there as well. Um, but just like you were saying, Julia, as well, with you know that um, eight hours on, sixteen hours off. We've no, kind of 16 gone. hours the other, on the other six, way around. The other way around. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I was gonna say, because yeah, yeah, the 16 on eight hours off. Yeah, it being dark, all the lights. I'm in the greenhouse now, all the lights are still on until till we get to that point. And then by the end of the show, they'll all go off for that eight hour cycle. Right. Cycle right. Up for morning. 
Yeah. Okay. That's good. Well, it's good that, well, if you go dark, then we know we've stayed too long, right? <laughs> In that classroom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <It's> totally <laughs> drop. <laughs> um, so Karen has a really good question. She's so, saying, I, oh, go ahead, Matt. Oh, no, no, that was, yep. Sorry. That's exactly what I was going to say. Oh, Karen's got okay. that question. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, are there any plants that you should not use a grow light on? No, I wouldn't say like for vegetables. No, definitely not. I think that all vegetables benefit from a grow light. The only time you wouldn't use a grow light, maybe uh, Matthew, you know this better, like some house plants. If you're keeping your plants, house plants under a grow light, some don't want to have full sun. So you would, that's maybe the one you wouldn't put a grow light under. They need like a dappled kind of light. But in terms of crops, I would say all crops, flowers benefit from a grow light. What do you think, Matthew? Agreed? Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, all those crops want that nice highlight to get that quality uh, plant growing and greening and getting those nutrients flowing. But yeah, when it comes to that house plant, yeah, even growing in like the greenhouses, they'll often have them in a lower light situation uh, because they don't need all of that direct sunlight. Or if they do grow them in that full sunlight, then there's that period where we're gonna adapt them uh, or adjust them to that lower light before they hit retail or go home with someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. The one coming through, I get a little static there. Yeah, no, I know. It's a lot, well, we're always subject to um, to internet, so I know we had some issues. I had some issues before we started the show, but uh, and Matt, I told everybody how you're broadcasting from the classroom, so uh, so that is great. So because everybody was looking for him last week, so we didn't mention it. Because but. Uh, you know, everybody, we talked about hydroponics last week. So we touched a little bit on um, lighting in that situation and growing, um, growing in water. So that was kind of a cool show. Julia, do you do anything with any, anything in water? Have you experimented with that? No, it's no. <laughs> never. I no, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, never. It's, it seemed interesting. So, um, and I know I have my little click and grow um, that uh, in honor of the show last week, I got set up again. Um, but oh, it's like nice. three, three or so we, I'm growing ro um, rosemary, uh, basil and parsley. So, you know, it's three nice. little plants, but yes, it's automatically set up to come on. It'll come on during the show and go, you know, 16 hours uh, so as well. So, um, so yeah, so that is a good way. It's different than growing, you know, in, in soil, of course. Um, so if anybody missed last week's show with Tyler Barris and his book, then you can uh, check that out on, uh, our, on our podcast. But knowing about what to grow for vegetables, I think is something that, so everybody's so keen, but I think flowers too. Do you grow, like what's, do you grow, and you mentioned Lysianthus, do you grow many flowers? So I grow so many flowers. I, I love flowers in the garden. I think that they're so important for the pollinators. You know, it's, it solves the issue of pollination if you've got flowers co-planted in every bed. So every single bed in my garden, I have a ton of flowers with the veggies. I, and they're always buzzing with so many bees. We do have honeybees here. Uh, so we have our own bees. And I've, they're always in the garden and they're always buzzing around and taking pollen and eating and I'm really glad to see them so I don't have pollination issues but I also love the flowers in the garden for the aesthetic factor right so mm -hmm. I just love the garden with flowers and veggies so I grow everything this year is another another thing I'm growing a lot of tons is flowers so I'm as many interesting varieties of things that I could find so I'm doing a ton more zinnias and I love zinnias they're so spectacular in August and in mm -hmm. September, when everything is dead, and they are just like, especially the Benares uh, mix, you know, the Benares varieties, they have produced really giant flower heads. And they make amazing cut flowers, but I never cut them because I just want them in the garden. I don't want to, you know, I know I should cut them. And if I cut them, I'll get more. But, you know, if you cut them, you end up the next the side branches produce shorter stems. And I just really like the long stems. So ah. I just love them. So I love the reds and the yellows, you know, all the bright colors I can find the purples oh my goodness I love them so August that's when I, I like to have them there and so tons more zinnias this year that I haven't grown new varieties doubles that are really cool and a lot all the bachelor buttons I could find I'm growing this year all the colors pinks and white with purple purple with white you know white 
Um, and I harvest them for the flower petals because I use them in tea as well as like making soaps and body care products. So I like to grow my own flowers so that I can keep them and harvest them and eat them. So bachelor buttons, I'm doing straw flowers, just about every color I could find. I love straw flowers and you can harvest them later. I let them go. Try to harvest them before they start producing, um, before the center fills out. And you can just clip them and you can make crafts with them. And I keep like, I have a bowl, a dish of the straw flowers from two years ago in my gardening room. And they're still bright, still pink and red and they haven't changed color. They're amazing, right? You can put them in your bathroom. So I, all the straw flowers, tons of sweet peas, a pink marigold that I ordered off a company out of the, out of France, which is coming secret seed cartel. Mm -hmm. I ordered that a pink marigold. I've not seen that before. No, yeah. Neither have I. yeah. Yeah. Pink marigold. Yeah. And from so France. I, wow. From France. So, so secret seed cartel is a U.S. company that's also based in France. And so they, they ship all over. And they have amazing tomato varieties and they have this pink marigold that I'm excited to try this year, which I've never seen a pink marigold. And yeah, so all of that, not a lot of sunflowers because I found that in the past I've grown them and then the birds take the seeds yeah. and plant them themselves. So I find I don't need to because they always come up anyway. Um, yeah, sweet peas I mentioned. Yeah, I don't know, even more than that. I have matheola, the stalks coming. There's gonna have to be a ton of that. They smell so good. I mean, everything, everything I can... Cosmos, fun ones. And those are, I love late season ones, right? And Matheola will, um, which is stock, it will it will bloom after frost. Uh, they didn't die. I mean, in December, I was in my garden before we really had the cold, the bad frost. They were still there. Oh, so, wow. yeah. And even, you know, if I had petunias in my garden that never stopped after frost, they were still blooming. So, you know, great food for pollinators. So I really yeah. try to feed them in the late season and then I get to enjoy it. So yeah, lots, tons. Yeah, there's your answer. Oh, <laughs> Long oh, that's answer. great. No, yeah. I mean, and and grow lights for them as well, which was which makes it so. Yeah. So you're planning with vegetables and, and oh, grow and snapdragons. Light. Don't forget the snapdragons. They are going to be started early. I think March, mm. and then I I pinch them so that they can side branch and become bushier, and then I plant what I pinched, and I make more plants. And yeah, I have a video on that on YouTube. Actually, how to pinch your snapdragons. Ooh. to make more <laughs> to make more <laughs> yeah yeah well that is good Matthew Matthew frozen i think yeah i think Matthew's frozen. Of... <laughs> your face is frozen matthew <laughs> there you are. yes i'm very unstable in the greenhouse today <laughs> i'm not too sure what it is um you, hopefully you can hear me now <laughs> yep I was going to say, we yeah, we do have a few more uh, questions coming in as well. Um, kind of going back to, we were talking about water and hydroponically uh, growing. Tommy has written in, uh, hello, will my indoor plants require more water when using a grow light? So, so this is not a hydroponic question? This is not hydroponic, no. right? Right, so if okay. he plants and puts his things under the lights, is he going to end up needing to water more often? I think is what Tommy's asking. Well, the plants heat up because they're under the lights. If they're under an LED, they don't heat up. You find the LED doesn't have heat, but a fluorescent does generate heat, which is actually good for the, the plants. They, they like that heat helps them grow. Uh, but yeah, the heat of the light will dry out the seedling and you're going to want to water it on a regular basis. You don't want it to dry out because many crops and flowers will actually dry up quickly. The roots will dry and then the plant is dead. So yeah, definitely. But when you plant the seedlings, so when you start, when you plant the seeds, you cover them with plastic. I use a dome, like a plastic dome. Mm -hmm. And until they germinate, they don't need any water. Some take weeks to germinate. Even tomatoes can take two weeks to germinate. You don't need, as long as the dome is on, it keeps the humidity stable underneath and it doesn't require any water. But as soon as you remove that dome, you'll find that within a day, the soil will dry and then you need to start watering. I water everything from below. I never water from above. It keeps, prevents damping off. Damping off is kind of like a mold um, that attacks the stem of the seedling and you find that your seedling suddenly just tips over and it looks like this, the, this, this stem is black and it's dead. So, but if you water from below, it really controls the moisture level because you can take them out uh, from, I, put, I have a big tray that I put them into 
And then I right. remove them from the tray, let them drip, you know, the, they drain a bit and then I put them back in their place. And that prevents, that keeps the water level even and it makes it really easy because I just put it in the tray, do other things, come back and then switch them out, put something else in. And it keeps me from standing there and waiting, you know, and watering. And it's just mm -hmm. a lot easier thing to do. And you can actually put a little bit of nutrition in that water as the seedlings get bigger and older, a little bit of fish emulsion, and that would actually fertilize them at the same time. So it just okay. makes it a lot easier. Yeah, but is there a, is there a stage that you know, like, okay, it's been there this 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 tall, or it's been this long, and then now I can start fertilizing? Is there a secret there, or? So it's a, everyone says it does differently. So seed starting mix is sterile. There's no nutrients in it, except for maybe mycorrhizal bacteria. If mix like a pro mix might have mycorrhizal bacteria. Otherwise, it's a st sterile mix. It has no food in it. So what I do is I add worm castings into my seed starting mix to mend it. And I find that that keeps them going for a long time. But a seed itself, the cotyledon, so the, there's a seed coat and inside the seed coat, it's like a tiny baby plant. And then that emergence, the first two leaves are called cotyledon leaves or baby leaves, they're not true leaves. They have all the food that the plant needs in order to develop its first set of true leaves. Once that dies, you will see the cotyledon leaves will turn yellow and kind of die off. And then you'll see the first true leaves of the plant. Once they get to that stage, and if you don't have nutrition in your soil, you can then start fertilizing. But I wouldn't do it on a regular basis and I wouldn't do it every watering. I would probably start as I see, if I see the leaves start to yellow and the plant mm -hmm. looks like it's not thriving, then I would start once a month, maybe once every two weeks, adding a little bit of fish emulsion. Right. Uh, but I prefer to start with worm castings. And I find that that gives them all they need to really grow um, for a while before they need anything else. And once you start seeing the yellowing, purpling of leaves, that's when yeah. you know the nutrients are off. And that's when you can start giving okay. them something. But very, very, very diluted and make sure you water them thoroughly first so that way that the, the fertilizer can run through and come out at the bottom or you'll burn the roots or burn the plant and they won't recover ah okay excellent yeah. um so i'm just going to respond to frank uh, has left us a message here saying about that his plants get six to seven hours of direct sunlight through a southern window however should he supplement with another hour or two from a grow light so frank at the beginning of the show we talked about how this time of year the light through a sunny window isn't quite what we need and that really the plants do better with up to 16 hours of uh of uh, day of light so that's something you know um that we covered at the beginning and that's something to keep in mind that the light you know the sun is very low even though it's a southern window right it's it's a different yep. type of sun that you would get in april or may so if you're if you're doing that now it's less if like you said you could be more successful um, later in the season, if you're starting seeds April or May, so that's right. And you know, answer. you could even you you could even have one of those grow light lamps that is basically like an arm, and you can have it next to the window if you want. And then you have that light overhead, and then the light outside disappears, and that thing would still provide light because the back side of the plant, away from the window, is not receiving light; it's in the shade. Mm. So by doing that, if you really, if you still want to have some of the light from the window, that's fine. But then that overhead light would then supplement and provide them. I would run that on a 16 hour shift anyway. And then you, right. can, you can still get sunlight and that light together. If you only have a little bit, like a tray of plants or not a, not a lot. Okay. Well, there you go. Oh. So I hope that helps Frank. Um, and Beth is asking, like, I think grow lights have come a long way. So Beth is asking, are grow lights dangerous? Um, do they overheat? And how far should they be from plants? So yeah, they, they've come a long way, right? Yes, they don't overheat. The fluorescent tubes do not overheat. They are warm, but you can put your hand right on them and actually like put your hand around them. They won't burn you. Like they're warm, but they won't, they're not like scorching hot. Not like a light bulb, right? A light bulb in your lamp mm. would be really hot and you couldn't touch it, but I find the fluorescent is not as hot. And LED has no heat. So if you really want to have something that's not heating up at all is if you get an LED light you won't be it'll be cold to the touch right right so okay all right and um carl is asking about regular light bulbs which would do get hot like he said you know for could he use those for a grow light what is the advantage of dis disadvantage of using one um like most people i have a million bulbs laying around his house so we although frank we never seem to be able to carl never find one when we need one but anyway <laughs> in this house. but i think it's you know when you were talking about having the like the importance of the four tubes like it's coverage so i think if you're doing a standalone 
bulb on a tray, that's where it, it, it's really not enough. And I think too, the light bulb light is different than the daylight fluorescent tube. So the fluorescent tube has more spectrum of light in it. It's daylight. It would like it basically mimics daylight that you would have right. outside and it doesn't heat up. I think that if you put it under a light bulb, you would actually have run a fire hazard and you would also burn your plant if it's too close. Cause I keep my lights two inches above the tops of the plants. And if I put a light bulb next to uh, my plants, I think I would burn my plant and potentially cause a fire with the light bulb. So no, mm. definitely don't use that. Okay, well, there you go. Some really good questions. Before we go, I mean, because the time just flies. Um, and these Whoa. are the best, great questions. I know, these are such <laughs> amazing questions. But why don't you take a few minutes and just tell our listeners a little bit about your uh, new ebook? Because I think yes. I bet a lot of the stuff we just talked about, you know, they can they can check check out your new ebook. So I, I wrote an ebook. Matthew, thank you so much for purchasing it, by the way. Did you have a chance to look at it yet? No. <laughs> I did, and it's fantastic. I was just bringing it back up right now, actually. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're my first. Um, oh. I just published it. We just put it on the website. So I wrote a book called um, Planning Your Vegetable Garden or something like that, right? How to Plan Your Vegetable Garden. Whatever so it it's, yeah. <laughs> Come on to something else right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> But it's, it's basically, it's 10 steps to get you, give you all the information you need to plan your first, plan and build your first vegetable garden. It tells, I walk you through all the steps, like what are the most important steps? I think the first six are the most important steps. Like all the things I really think that are important is like the size of beds, raised beds, ease of watering is really important. Um, plant, did I talk about plants? I don't know why. <laughs> something else. <laughs> um, but then I also talk about like, you know, other things too, like aesthetic things, you know, do you want to have compost bins? Do you want to have a fountain in there? Um, do you want to have a place to sit, a shed, a greenhouse, like all these things, all the things that you would need to get you started building your first garden. If you're gardening on a slope, you know, what you need to consider the best place to locate your garden, right? When I moved to this house, we live on the escarpment and it's like really wavy and undulating and you really want to try to put your garden in the most flat location so that you don't get water runoff and, you know, losing soil. You don't want your seeds to slide away from you. So if you're going to build on a slope and that's the only land you have, you can make tears. So I talk about that. I talk about, um, I just lost my thought. Um, what you want to grow is really important. Like how much space do you need based on how much you want to grow? Like you don't need to go big. You can go whatever you need yeah. to grow. If you, if you want to do canning, you want to account for all that. So this book covers all these things that you could get started. It's not a long book, so it's easy to read, but it gives you ideas for your own personal garden. And if you, even if you have a garden, how you can adapt it to make it, you know, your dream garden, all the things you want to have in your dream garden. So it's on my website and it's Excellent. in my shop. So to get to my shop, it's juliademacos.com. So my name, juliademacos.com slash shop. And it's the first item in there. Excellent. Excellent. And if you do, uh, you know, if you heard about it here on the show, then, you know, let uh, Julian know that you heard about it here. <laughs> so, uh, yes, you know, message uh, DTGP, our little initials or something like that, because we, you know, we want to uh, thank you for joining us because we we're excited. We uh, everybody know we're having her back on uh, March 7th for herbs. So we're going to do like, a, like a really focused show on herbs. And Matt, it's so funny you mentioned bees because Matt and I've been wanting to talk about to somebody about bees so you know um so are you harvesting so just a segue quickly i know it's supposed to be grow under lights but are you harvesting the honey or is it just so i have a beekeeper who okay. is here who, who comes and he manages them we started off with five and now we have 13 hives Excellent. and so he did the harvesting i wasn't involved this last year because I was so busy in the garden and I had a bit of a reaction from a wasp sting actually I, I was stung four times last year but usually twice at a time um and but four different times I kept getting stung it was unbelievable how many bugs we had in the garden so and I had some reaction from it so I was a little bit cautious yeah, of getting yeah, too involved too. um but yeah we, I've helped him and harvesting and getting oh, the honey good. out and taking the capping off. I mean, the whole thing and smoking the bees and I love them if I had more time, but yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Think. It's hard to do both. Right. So yeah. So maybe it is. you'll have to see, 
check him out, see if he'll be interested in talking to us. So yeah. uh, it would be good to learn more about that. But I'm so excited to learn about growing under lights. And I think a lot, I think it shows that based on our listener questions, like it seems a little intimidating. Like, is it more, are they going to overheat? Is it something I have to worry about? Is it something that they're going to dry out so quickly? But it really is a tool to make you more successful. Like really yes. it, it is, right? There is no, I have no stress about them overheating. They sit on a timer. I don't touch them. They, the only time I turn them off is when all the plants are out of the house. They're, so they're mostly on, you know, they're on at least eight months of the year and I have no issues. You know, they're on when I go to bed, they turn off by themselves, they turn on by themselves and on, it's been no stress, no headache, and there's been no burning, no smell. You know, these are properly designed to be able to run and envision like a Walmart and shop lights in the, in the ceiling and they're on how many hours a day are they open for, right? And yeah. the quantity of them. And there is no heating and smoking. Like this is a something that's designed to work. And, you know, LEDs even more so, like there's no heat coming from them. They're more energy efficient. And either one will work. It depends what you want to pay, but literally a four tube, one unit with chains and hooks is so inexpensive. From I think I paid, I don't know, 60 bucks for the whole thing. You know, I don't know what it costs today. Prices have changed. I've had them for years, but you know, it wasn't a lot to, to get started and it has definitely changed. Like it's a game changer in the seed starting department. I highly recommend mm-hmm. investing in that. That's the one thing you could even hang them on top of a table. They don't have to be with a whole racking system. All the racks are not expensive, right? So right. really there's a lot of um, inexpensive options. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that is wonderful. Well, we thank you very much. I know time is uh, time is always uh, well. It's always been so much fun to kind of geek out on all of this stuff. But uh, yeah, and I know there's a lot of keeners out there that are considering. Um, I do, do you like to say like look at your last frost date? I know you gave us some t- things that start earlier versus later, but you know that you really want to put out you know established plants, but you don't want to well, get them too too much. So, so right? I might as well do a little plug now. Another plug for me. In my shop, I have a seed starting calculator, which is a tool that I created years ago to help you know exactly what to start, what day, how many weeks before your final frost date. And even for fall crops, I have your first frost date and exactly when to start them until the last day. And so that'll help you. So all you do is enter your final frost date for where you live. For me, it's June 1st. And it tells you the day, the the day range to start them. And it just makes your life so much it's five dollars it's an on, the, on an excel spreadsheet and i have everything from a to z flowers fruit sorry flowers vegetables and herbs everything's on there I, I don't think i miss anything i think i tried to update it as much as i can but it's through experience that i've added it in there based on what i've not just you know it's it's, it's what works for me in my garden space so definitely right. check that out it's my seed starting calculator and i have an outdoor planting calculator too there that tells you when it's safe to put it out so I got you covered. Excellent. Excellent. And all that will be, all of our links and all that information will be in our show notes too. So if anybody didn't catch it all, uh, it will all be there. And the link to uh, Julia's ebook will be there also. Thank you. I uh, can't wait to be back. This was so much fun. Yes. We'll talk to you again. March 7th. I'm excited. Yes. Okay. We'll talk to you again in a few weeks. But thank you everybody for joining us down the garden path here on Reality Radio 101. All about growing under light. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for listening to Down the Garden Path with your hosts, Joanne Shaw and Matthew Dressing, right here on Reality Radio 101.